An open letter to Glenn Greenwald. In writing this letter to you, I wish to acknowledge the enormous service your writings and media appearances have done for progressive thought in America. As so many so-called progressive commentators in the last three years have proven to their shame, there is no guarantee that liberals will uphold liberal principles when a Democrat who vehemently opposes such principles happens to be sitting in the White House. Your refusal to go along with the hypocrisy of the Obama apologists and your willingness to call them on it time and again is wholly admirable. And for that very reason, it pains me to see you time and time again censor, either consciously or unconsciously, certain facts that your readers need to know to make the appropriate progressive choice in November. In your famous New Year's Eve Salon article about Ron Paul, you wrote, no doubt sincerely, I am not endorsing or expressing support for anyone's candidacy. But in that article, you frame the entire debate in ways that don't fairly pre represent the options available to your readers in the coming presidential election. Ironically, in summarizing in that same article, the heinous, your word, positions of the current president, you have expressed in the following words, perhaps more eloquently than anyone else, the progressive case against Obama. He has slaughtered civilians, Muslim children by the dozens, not once or twice, but continuously in numerous nations with drones, cluster bombs, and other forms of attack. He has sought to overturn a global ban on cluster bombs. He has institutionalized the power of presidents in secret and with no checks to target American citizens for assassination by CIA, far from any battlefield. He has waged an unprecedented war against whistleblowers, the protection of which was once a liberal shibboleth he rendered permanently irrelevant the War Powers Resolution, a crown jewel in the list of post-Vietnam liberal accomplishments, and thus enshrined the power of presidents to wage war even in the face of a congressional vote against it. His obsession with secrecy is so extreme that it has become darkly laughable in its manifestations and even worked to amend the Freedom of Information Act another crown jewel of liberal legislative successes, when compliance became inconvenient, he has entrenched for a generation the once reviled, once radical Bush-Cheney terrorism powers of indefinite detention, military commissions, and the state secret privilege as a weapon to immunize political leaders from the rule of law. He has shielded Bush-era criminals from every last form of accountability. He has vigorously prosecuted the cruel and supremely racist war on drugs, including those parts he vowed during the campaign to relinquish, a war which devastates minority communities and encages and converts into felons huge numbers of minority youth for no good reason. He has empowered thieving bankers through the Wall Street bailout, fed secrecy, efforts to shield mortgage, mortgage defrauders from prosecution, and the appointment of an endless roster of former Goldman Sachs executives and lobbyists. He's brought the nation to a full-on Cold War and a covert hot war with Iran on the brink of far greater hostilities. He has made the U.S. as subservient as ever to the destructive agenda of the right-wing Israeli government. His support for some of the Arab world's most repressive regimes is as strong as ever. Most of all, America's national security state, its surveillance state, and its posture of endless war is more robust than ever before. You, Glenn Greenwald, conclude that progressives are supporting a candidate for president who has done all of that, things liberalism has long held to be pernicious. Actually, some progressives have already rejected Obama, if they ever supported him in the first place. But I'd agree that the majority do still support him, and however you may find that fact disheartening, 
you are implicitly accepting, even condoning this state of affairs by refusing to acknowledge the real progressive alternative in the coming election, offered by the Green Party nominee, who will almost certainly be Dr. Jill Stein. In the same article, you write the following, whatever else one wants to say, it is indisputably true that Ron Paul is the only political figure with any sort of national platform, certainly the only major presidential candidate in either party who advocates policy views on issues that liberals and progressives have long flamboyantly claimed are both compelling and crucial. Now, it may be true that Jill Stein who has unequivocally advocated those same progressive views, lacks a national platform. But if so, whose fault is that? Stein's herself or that of nationally respected progressive commentators like you, who refuse to even acknowledge her existence? And it's very significant and very depressing that you immediately qualify your initial statement with the phrase, certainly the only major presidential candidate in either party, implicitly accepting the lie that the rancid two-party system, which voters in poll after poll are rejecting in ever-increasing numbers, is the only possible source of political legitimacy. We Greens also find it extremely strange that you persist on playing with those who have criticized or condemned you because of your favorable comments on some of Ron Paul's views. The strange game of weighing the good and evil on both sides of the Obama-Paul divide as if there were no candidate who represents the progressive worldview on both civil liberties and reproductive rights and on both foreign and domestic policy. With Jill Stein in the race, I, as a progressive voter, don't have to care what either Ron Paul or President Obama says or does. I have a real choice. The ubiquitous Obama ads on the internet are all asking the same question. Are you in? It's, an, it's a good question and a fateful one. Because if a progressive American who opposes 90% of what Obama does and stands for, and how can any real progressive not do that, still counts himself or herself in by donating to him or campaigning for him or even simply by voting for him, that progressive has ceased to be a true citizen in a sense, cease to be a morally responsible human being. But the insidious lie maintaining the two-party system in this country, even now, long after most Americans have lost, lost any love they ever had for either party, holds that if one is not in the Obama camp, one is automatically in the loathsome camp of Romney, Gingrich, and Santorum. And some of those who refuse to buy into this, you're either for us or against us nonsense, may be motivated to do the wrong thing by the obscure fear of finding themselves permanently out, that is, utterly marginalized politically. And all these fears are predicated on the assumption that in the immortal words of Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. By wrongly implying to your loyal readers, Mr. Greenwald, that there really is no alternative to Obama and the Republic fascists, or that the only other serious option is the unacceptable one represented by Ron Paul's candidacy, you have done a major disservice to them and to the country. But of course, I wouldn't be writing this if I thought it was too late for you or your readers people who want America to follow the path of justice and truth, people whose politics are left of center fear the Republicans with good reason, but it is irrational for them to refuse to support Jill Stein because of the fear that Romney will win. Obama and Romney are as close as two opposing mainstream party candidates could be. Obamacare is Romneycare, 
by another name. Both men want to cut taxes for the rich and corporations and gut social programs, and both men are threatening Iran. If giving Jill Stein a national platform accomplishes nothing else, it will provide a powerful voice to express how insane, how disastrous a war with Iran would be. Sometimes expressing a problem in its starkest terms not only clarifies the mind, but makes the solution to the dilemma self-evident. So I'm asking you, Glenn Greenwald, do you believe as I do that humanity is facing the greatest crisis in its history, one in which we as a species must make drastic changes within the very next generation, not 50 or 100 or 200 years from now, or else we shall perish in this century or the next, to paraphrase Thomas Pynchon, meanly in our own wastes. If the answer to that question is yes, do you believe that Barack Obama, the most powerful man on earth, is a leader both qualified and willing to help America and the world meet this unprecedented challenge? And if that answer is no, and all your own writing on Obama proves that no is the only possible answer, then it is an immoral act for you or indeed for any true progressive to vote for him for president in 2012, or even to refrain from voting entirely so long as there is a real progressive alternative. That alternative, as mentioned before, will almost certainly be Jill Stein. You may ask, don't you think it's arrogant of you to imply that your candidate is the only true candidate for progressives? That your way is the only true way? Perhaps it would be if the crisis we're all facing were not so enormous, if Barack Obama could offer even the faintest hope of resolving it, and if time were not so short. But it's too late to mince words, too late to indulge those faint-hearted progressives who are getting ready to compromise their principles yet again. The Occupy Movement accomplished more for the progressive cause in a few weeks than Obama has in the entire three wretched years of his presidency. Unlike the president who has ruthlessly tried to suppress the movement, Stein has strongly supported it almost from the beginning. And it may be partly because of this fact that the great Noam Chomsky broke from his practice of supporting lesser evil candidates to publicly endorse Stein in the Massachusetts primary. Will you, Glenn Greenwald, and your loyal readers have the courage to follow Chomsky's lead?